Okay, um, good evening everyone and uh, thanks for being the uh, real troopers and uh, joining us at this uh, point in the evening. Uh, appreciate you showing up. So I'm John Mallory. I'm on the uh, storage business development team for uh, AWS, focus a lot on data lakes. Um, so I'm going to kick this off and then I have Gene and Josh who will uh, introduce themselves to uh, talk about a use case using um, S3 for a data lake style architecture. So we'll try to wrap this up in about 50 minutes and give you some time for questions. So uh, hang in there if uh, you have burning questions you want to ask. So to start it off, um, when we think about data lakes and one of the drivers towards building an architecture on S3, it's really that for most customers we find that um, deriving value from data and how they use data for their businesses is really a journey. They're not, unless they're very sophisticated and they're doing this on-prem today and want to lift and shift to uh, AWS, um, they're probably going to start out with a few well-defined, you know, high-value, traditional use cases, and from there really explore how they can um, use data to evolve and transform their business. And so really one of the precepts when we build a data lake is how can we build an architecture that's going to let them take this journey non-disruptively, you know, where they can, once they get the data established, they can innovate around the data using more and more sophisticated tools and methods as they evolve so that, you know, they can move from basic things like uh, maybe BI, data warehouse augmentation, to you know, much more advanced things like advanced analytics, AI, ML, and you know, tie that back to uh, business outcomes. So why do people use AWS for big data? Or why should you consider you know, what we're going to talk about next um, for your business? Um, and some of the fundamentals are it's about agility. How can you take your data and quickly find new value in that data, and then quickly, you know, if you find a use case where you've got uh, new value established by using new analytic methods, maybe applying some model training to a historical data set, you can quickly roll that into production and um, essentially speed time to results. So that's really a key um, attribute of uh, a data lake that we're promoting is, you know, go fast, fail fast, but when you find something that works, quickly roll that into production, which is all about scalability and cost effectiveness. So once you find a use case you want to adopt, you want to be able to scale that seamlessly, non-disruptively, and cost effectively. And so those are key considerations versus maybe trying to do this on-prem where you have to worry about provisioning hardware, you know, deploying the services you want to use, getting those into production, that can take a long time. Um, another is services. We have a lot of services that can help you quickly derive value from your data. And that's one of the themes of this presentation is how can you use essentially serverless capabilities and query in place capabilities to quickly experiment and then innovate around your data without having to worry about a lot of pre-provisioning of uh, assets or migrating data from one platform to another before you can actually use it, um, which plays into the get to um, insights much more quickly, since that's really the bottom line is speed. I mean, um, that is uh, really probably as much as cost, or in a lot of cases even more so than cost. Um, a key business outcome is how can you get to results more quickly um, and then finally, a lot of you are probably doing this on-prem, so how can we make it easier to migrate your data, migrate your use cases, move to the cloud more quickly so you can really start to realize these benefits much more um, in a much quicker fashion and in a more cost-effective fashion. So how do we define data lake since the term's been around pretty much since the early days of Hadoop kind of kicked off this whole um, discussion around data lake and defining a data lake. We define it, uh, you know, somewhat similarly, but maybe with some additional twists. So essentially it's about taking your data 
and centralizing it on a common platform. So maybe you have a lot of silos that are purpose-built to do specific things today. How can we kind of take all those silos, maybe all those forked copies of data that start to get tough to govern, consolidate, and then build around that? So that's the foundation of the data lake is consolidate your data, separate the compute, the processing, all the tools that you bring to the data so that you can kind of innovate around this data non-disruptively. So decoupled storage and compute and process. You want to be able to get the data in and transform it into usable formats quickly. So that's another key attribute of it. Ultimately, if you're taking a bunch of purpose-built silos, maybe for different lines of business, how do you bring those together into a centralized but secure and multi-tenant platform? So secure multi-tenancy is another attribute. Um, and ultimately, in the spirit of time to results, how can you do more in place with the data? And then finally, for rapid innovation around your data, how can you essentially define schema on the fly so that you can experiment around your data much more quickly rather than having rigidly defined schema that take a lot of time to transform and model before you can ask a new question of your data. So these are some of the concepts that we apply to defining an AWS data lake. Um, so what do I mean by processing and querying in place, since that's the title of this uh, presentation? Essentially, there are two fundamental concepts here. One is how do you process data with user-defined functions? So if you're doing custom processing, if you're trying to build data pipelines, kind of do multi-step processing and want to orchestrate that all, how do you do that? And that's really what we call user-defined functions, where you're going to bring your own code, your own functions, your own tools, and essentially execute all that without having to worry about physical infrastructure. So that's the first element of processing and querying in place, is really using Lambda as the engine to do that. Um, and obviously, there are a whole host of Lambda sessions uh, here at the conference, um, so I won't belabor that, but it is a key tool in building a data lake, particularly in starting to automate how you use the data lake um, so that you can really focus less on orchestration and more on uh, querying your data and deriving value, which is the second function is how can you go from managed services or unmanaged services where you have to spin up servers, provision, install code, and manage all the updates, kind of um, you know, do infrastructure, much as you do on-prem today typically, and start to turn that into managed services where all you worry about is executing queries and catalogs and transformations against your data without worrying about physical resources. So that's the second part, is how do you catalog, transform, and query your data once it's in S3 without having to worry about physical resources. And that really comes down to services like Glue, Athena, Redshift Spectrum, SageMaker is um, some common examples. So once you start to use these definitions, this is what a data lake starts to look like conceptually, where you have a lot of different ingest methods because a data lake is going to have to encompass a lot of different data sources and you want to match the right tool to the right data source, both to optimize cost, time to ingest, and efficiency. Um, and then how do you start to bring processing and analytics um, to the data where it lives in place in S3, which S3 really becomes the foundation of the data lake, and then, just as importantly, how do you catalog and transform that data? Because without a catalog, a data, log is, a data lake is meaningless. It's just a data store. Um, and then how do you control access and security around that common platform to get back to that multi-tenancy? So this is an example of the services we apply. So a whole host of NGO services, some very specific catalog and transform services, a lot of different both native AWS um, processing and analytic tools, as well as a whole host of third-party vendors through our marketplace that you can bring to S3 into the data. And then the foundation that ties across all of these is access and security through things like IAM 
and encryption. So why do we use S3 for the data lake? Um, several different region, reasons to do this. The first is durability. I mean, if you're going to consolidate all your data, put it on a platform, that's got to be rock solid. Um, S3 has 11 nines of durability spread across multiple physically separated access zones, good levels of availability. It's really designed to be mission critical grade in terms of how it protects your data against loss, corruption, and how it makes it available. So that's a foundation of uh, if you're going to use this data to drive business value, it's got to be rock solid in those elements. Um, high performance is another characteristic of S3, which may be counterintuitive if you come from the traditional on-premise world of flash arrays and Hadoop and you know, a lot of other uh, you know, in-memory um, databases and um, you know, things like Spark. But ultimately, if you consider about a big data platform, what you really want to be able to do is scan and process large volumes of data very quickly and have that scale without limits. And that's what S3 excels at is, is you know, essentially performance scales very linearly as you throw more and more threads of work against that data store. And you can get tremendously high amounts of throughput. I mean, we have customers doing hundreds of gigabytes up to you know, terabyte level uh, types of process against data in S3. So for a lot of big data workloads, it's a very high performance, seamlessly scalable platform. Um, security is key. I mean, IAM is the foundation of security at S3. Um, that integrates into S3. You can get granular access down to, you know, essentially prefix and even individual object level and tie that across multiple services. So multi-tenant security is baked in. And then really, Ease of use is important because you don't want to worry about managing your data, managing your storage platforms. You want to worry about how you get value out of that data. And then finally, integration with a whole host of third-party vendors and a lot of native services where you can process the data in place is also very important. So another key element is cost optimization. How can you collect and store cost-effectively more data often plays into uh, how you derive more value from your data. Particularly when you're talking about things like model training for machine learning, of taking a lot of historical data, building models, and then going back and testing and validating those models based on real world historical data. Also, how can you kind of optimize that balance between performance and storage and bulk capacity and so really you can start to build a tiering strategy where high performance workloads may live on local block volume storage with things like um, SSD volumes or NVMe um, storage. But then ultimately the balance of your data can start to set up a tiering strategy so that historical data can be kept much more cost effectively. And so an example here is with Hadoop. I mean, essentially, if you have Spark, you have very high performance Hadoop workloads, store those in a local file system, but then use S3 and by extension Glacier for colder, deeper, more historical data assets or data that isn't processed as frequently. And then you can start to set up policies to automate that using tools that are baked into S3, like storage analytics to help you make intelligent decisions about where to place data. Um, we talked about rapid ingest and matching the ingest of the data to um, how you get it into uh, your data lake. And so essentially, you're going to have a lot of different data sources from streaming data, where you may use the Kinesis family of product, um, traditional relational databases and data warehouses where you may use database migration services to integrate into the data lake. Um, a lot of different traditional sensor devices um, and file storage on-prem, where you may use things like Storage Gateway to convert files to objects natively, preserve their metadata, 
and all the data attributes. Um, and then things like lift and shifting from on-premise Hadoop clusters. Um, maybe you collect data offline. Like we have a cruise ship uh, customer who essentially puts snowball devices on their ships at the end of the journey, um, ship those back to AWS, ingest that into the cloud, and then they can quickly um, analyze that data, you know, do model training so that they can make their routing and um, essentially optimize their cost and uh, fuel economy and routing um, based on, you know, journey that was collected over the course of, uh, or data that was collected over the course of a journey. And then finally, you're probably always, if you're on-prem today, want to go to do hybrid environments. So you can start to do direct connect, virtual private cloud, so you can integrate the on-premise world and the cloud world together from an analytics and a data lake perspective. Um, other considerations, um, people think of a data lake as one big S3 bucket when we talk about consolidating data, but that's not a good design pattern. Essentially for reasons of data governance, um, you know, kind of controlling how data gets checked into your data lake so that your data lake is curated high quality data. Um, things like keeping all your raw source data for historical purposes, but then maybe having optimized data go into the data lake. You want to probably start to segregate ingest buckets and transformation buckets and keep those separate and distinct from the actual data lake itself. It just makes life much easier and it's a great design pattern that you can prepare the data, keep raw assets, and govern the data more effectively than just dumping it all in the data lake and then trying to use it. Um, you probably want to think about how you can aggregate smaller files, particularly if you're doing streaming workloads, into larger files because that's more cost effective, it's going to be more performant, and it's easier to manage. And a lot of analytic tools will work better with larger files, particularly if you um, optimize the format as part of that aggregation process as well. Um, you're going to want to use the right tool to integrate the data in. For example, if you've got file data, you're going to want to use something like Storage Gateway to uh, use that and integrate that into the data lake. And you're going to want to start to automate all these data pipelines using functions like Lambda. So you can really focus on building the pipeline once to accommodate your use cases, and then focus on how you actually derive value from the data rather than all the orchestration stuff, since that's really just a necessity. Um, so Kinesis is really a great tool for um, essentially streaming data ingest into the data lake multiple flavors of it. And when we talk about data lake, a lot of people think traditional structured, semi-structured data is really what defines a data lake. But more and more, we're seeing use cases where a data lake starts to encompass unstructured data like voice and video as well. Um, like we have um, you know, several people that do video ingest for security analytics, for sports analytics, um, multimedia where they want to start to automatically, using machine learning, tag and categorize data, query on different types of data, that's also a data lake use case. And things like Kinesis video streams and some of our richer media services like um, Recognition and Lex, you know, start to play into that video and voice domain for data lakes as well. So think broad when you're thinking about how you might build a data lake architecture to encompass broader sets of data than just traditional analytics. Um, so if you start to think about building this pipeline, this is an example of what it looks like where you start to have different steps in your workflow from ingest to catalog and transformation to process in place, but then maybe load into more optimized um, tools where you're loading a curated data set into a tool like Redshift for an enterprise data warehouse query scenario, and start to automate that um, with uh, Lambda functions is um, another good design consideration. 
Um, but ultimately, we want to try to, as much as possible, heavily leverage process data in place. Because this means you're going to focus on using the functionality you want to get value out of data um, without having to move data between different tools. You bring the tools to the data. So once you have it in S3, you can start to use things, as I mentioned earlier, like Athena for ad hoc query, Redshift Spectrum for data warehouse um, type scenarios, SageMaker for uh, model training at scale, and AWS Glue for things like cataloging and transforming your data in place. So another key consideration in building a data lake is we continue to try to add capabilities to S3 that are really going to enhance what you can do with your data. So last year, the first step in this was we introduced S3 Select and Glacier Select, where essentially you can start to access your data in a way that's much more optimized for analytics and data lake style environments than just the traditional get object. And so essentially the motivation behind introducing this was if you think about a lot of analytic tools, it's about scanning large volumes of data to get specific parts of that data to actually um, execute on. Redshift Spectrum, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more, essentially is one of those scenarios where it's a data warehouse, a lot of data scans typically involved. Um, you would traditionally load that data into uh, Redshift execute there, but with Spectrum, you can now store data in S3 as tables and scan across those. So when people ran these type of jobs, they queried a bunch of data and then threw a lot of that data on the floor after they retrieved it from S3. So a lot of customers could only potentially use about 10% of the data that they would actually retrieve from S3 at the end of the day. And so essentially what S3 Select and Glacier Select were was what if you could start to intelligently have the storage layer based on things like SQL expressions, do the scanning of the data and the filtering of data in the storage layer where the data lives and only return the results that are relevant to those SQL scans. So you could start to do things like from this object rather than do a get object, have a push down where you could issue a SQL statement saying, select this object and then issue from this object essentially SQL um, conditionals where you know, maybe you would say, out of this object, I only want the data that is going to be, if it's demographic data, you know, a user that is um, from this IP address or a range of IP addresses push that down via SQL statements, S3 will perform that scan, only return the results that are actually needed. So if you think about that, that's very different. The storage is now intelligent. And so you can start to do things quicker, more cost effectively. A couple of examples, we had an SA that uh, went and for fun using Lambda, wrote a serverless MapReduce function using S3 Select and comparing that to what they would do without select. And essentially, for a given uh, function, they were able to do it 2x faster at a fifth of the cost. Um, another one is with EMR 5.18, which is relatively new. We now have a Presto connector for EMR that leverages S3 select, where it essentially will do predicate pushdown um, and use S3 select to pre-filter data. So now if you consider a job before, a job after, it can be as much as 5x faster at you know, essentially 2.5% the um, compute for a given process job, which means it's much more cost effective and much quicker. Um, choosing the right data formats, another key consideration. So essentially there's no such thing as a best data format but if you're using CSV, TSV, JSON, they're easy to use, they're ubiquitous, but they're not efficient. So if you start to consider moving to something like a optimized columnar compressed self-describing format, 
It's often much quicker to uh, scan that data, query that data, as well as much more cost effective. So you want to consider getting your data in the right format, maybe in one of these staging buckets, before you actually load it in the data lake itself. And here's an example, not that you would ever do a you know, select star statement, but kind of an extreme use case where if you had you know, like a standard textile format, you converted that to parquet, it's you know, essentially about 99% um, faster to query, 99 plus percent cheaper to query, and uses about an eighth of the space to store that in S3. So you can see what a big win this is all around, both from your raw storage cost as well as your scan and query cost. Um, and really, getting all this data prep done, aggregating your data, getting it ready to use is the majority of the work that you need to do. So in terms of speeding time to results, if you could start to transform that data, catalog that data where it lives um, natively, that's a big win. And that's why we developed Glue, which essentially is serverless ETL and data catalog for data that lives in S3. So as you ingest data in, you trigger Glue, it'll crawl the data, discover it, discover schema in the data, build the data catalog that all these query in place analytic tools can use. And then if you want to do things like transform into Parquet, you author a transformation job using um, you know, typical Python uh, Spark. And um, essentially, you can execute those um, uh, ETL jobs serverlessly as well in S3. Um, other query in place tools that are really important, Athena, as I talked about, if you want to do ad hoc SQL exploration of data, Athena is a great tool to do that. Essentially, you go to the console, you define tables of data in S3, you write SQL queries, you execute them, you only pay for the amount of data you scanned. So it's quick, it's easy, it's cost effective. Standard SQL, so you can start to use third party tools that do things like data visualization, JDBC to integrate with this. And now you've got a very easy way to start to explore, visualize, categorize your data. Um, Redshift Spectrum is a great tool if you have warehouses on prem. You want to bend the cost equation, get that data into S3. You can spin up a Redshift cluster for the highest performance, most critical, most complex data sets, but then keep all the extended data in table format in S3 and query across both of these domains. So it really changes the equation in the amount of data you can consume from a data warehouse environment and do it much more cost effectively in a much more performant manner. Um, SageMaker is a service we released a year ago here. It's really about how do you take data, large sets of data, build and train models very quickly, very cost effectively, get them into production with a whole variety of uh, AI ML tools. So you can use SageMaker against data in S3 to do this in place as well. So, Given this, what are some of the use cases we see customers using their data lakes for? Essentially, warehouse modernization and uh, BI augmentation is a very common use case for people that want to migrate from on-prem to AWS. If you're doing things like big Hadoop clusters on-prem, you're worried about protecting your data, you get a copy in S3 to protect your data, and then you can start to experiment, do uh, proof of values around that data, maybe roll new use cases into the cloud. Um, Real-time analytics using things like Kinesis, Spark, stream processing is big, and we'll hear uh, more about that um, from ProtectWise. And then BI and data exploration and AI and machine learning are also very common. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to a real-world case study to talk about some of these principles. Thank you, John. So uh, we're going to go through a case study about uh, how we ingest a massive amount of data and how we use S3 as a data lake. Um, we're going to get into it. I'm going to start with a little background, like our problem domain and the kind of data we work with, data volume, that kind of stuff. 
Um, but I, what I would like you to do is kind of mentally match your own problem sets that you're working on and think about this in terms of like, there's probably a lot of projects that you have that seem utterly untenable from like a data volume perspective. Or maybe a number of you here today are already working with what seems like untenable volumes of data. What we're going to show you is how to take a very progressive view into making a data lake really work well for you, that it's fully interactive, fully searchable, that kind of stuff. So a little background on ProtectWise. We're a startup. We're a young company. We've been on the market for about three and a half years. Um, we are what we would call a network detection and response. Basically, we do threat detection of network data uh, that is observed inside of our customers' networks, most of whom are very large organizations. So think large enterprise, Fortune 2000, a number of mid-market uh, customers as well. But uh, we passively get a copy of that data and ship it to the cloud. We compress, we optimize, stream it to the cloud. So think like packet capture data that's um, coming out of raw network streams, layer two uh, data and higher. Think if you are familiar with the OSI model. Also think about uh, features you extract from that data. And if you've been working with data for a long time, you know that data about data is often more voluminous than the source data that you started with. And you're really tempted to want to work with that, but it's it's a big challenge, right? And so today, um, inside of AWS, we ingest a ton of data per day. We do about uh, half a trillion uh, data points per hour, um, and we ingest that data, coalesce it down, that's at the top of the funnel, and we come pack that down into a data lake that is then used for not just like automated kind of threat detection, uh, but is also used for interactive querying so our customers can actually hit this data lake. So we're opening this up to the outside world. Um, and you've got to think of things like how many IP addresses do you see? How many network communications do you see? How many files? How many URLs? How many certificates? How many all this stuff that sits in network traffic, right? Go into that same data lake that is, spans into very, very large numbers and allow the, our users to just ask really open-ended, Lucene-style questions. Now, we're going to get into the meat of some of this technology, but remember, this is a 200-level introduction. We've been asked to keep it at a high level. If you want to dig deep, come talk to us afterwards. This rabbit hole goes down pretty far. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but you know, we've got a system that does you know, tens of millions of transactions and messages a second. It's a, it's, it's a lot of data. And in a previous era, this would have been really hard. In like a Hadoop type of world, it wouldn't have worked at all. Um, however, with new data technology sitting on top of uh, S3, we can do things that we were never able to do before. And it can be faster, and it can be cheaper, and it's just a lot easier than it used to be. So uh, when we were designing this, some core strategy, and I would like uh, you to think about uh, how you want to problem solve as a technologist inside of your own company. Um, core strategy are things like you know, time to market. You know, obviously, that's important for a startup, but it's important for anybody and any business group to think about themselves is that they can't be measured really on their ambition, their goals, and their hopes. You really only get measured by what you actually end up accomplishing, right? So think in terms of being able to move quickly. Think of also in terms of the cost of goods sold, your COGS, innovating on that front, we're talking about massive cost reduction here just a, just a moment ago, um, being able to be innovative with regard to the basic business costs of being able to exploit the data that you now are in charge of, that is core to your strategy. You know that's something you've got to adopt as a first principle. Um, you also want to take a very evolutionary architecture. So you don't want to solve all these things up front. You want to take a phased approach into building just a piece at a time, which is good. We can only handle so much at once. We have to have a clear mind about where we want to go, but just build this a piece at a time. And then provide a really fast feedback loop that allows continuous learning. So you're watching your progression through all of these stages, being able to go from a traditional, old school, big data type of system to uh, something that is yeah, maybe best described as post big data. It's a terrible term, but it's the worst except for all the other terms. Um, and then feed that into how you think about your own technology and how you iterate. Have a sense of continuous learning and attach that to the fact that just like time to market is foundational, human resource time is the most limited resource we have. So when ProtectWise was, was, was tackling this, we looked at basically how we source our data, how it flows through this pipeline, how we uh, index and how we store this in a way that can be really active. So let me paint that picture for you a little bit. Um, and then we're going to get into the bits and the bytes of how we delivered this technology. 
Um, at the end of the day, what we do is we give our customers these lightweight software sensors. They're free. They can have as many as they want, which means we can really open the floodgates on this. Uh, but what they do is they do packet capture. They compress. They optimize. They do some deep packet inspection, so packet by packet feature extraction. Um, and they come ship that to the cloud, which is AWS, obviously. And then we run it through a suite of threat detection capabilities, right? That's basic transactional type of stuff. That's good, but it's still like, you know, tens of millions of transactions a second. Um, and then we, uh, what's more interesting is that we store that data for an unlimited amount of time. In fact, our standard offering is a year retention. When you think of this, this is an obscene amount of data, right? But it's super manageable. This is the cool part, and this is what I want you to take away from this. And the core element behind all of this kind of strategy was our willingness to bet on AWS's roadmap to say, you know, we are not in an infrastructure business. You know, when we would talk to certain investors and other business leaders and, you know, people in the industry, they're like, well, that much data. You need to be building your own data center, right? I mean, I'm probably preaching to the choir. You're here at AWS for a reason. That is nonsense. That is a previous era's way of thinking. Innovation, time to market, COGS innovation specifically, uh, these types of things are the core challenge. Being good at them means you get to win. And so we're going to walk you through this a little bit. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about this COGS innovation, and then we'll move on to the tech. The rate of innovation is king. That is the number one thing. Your ability to create new technology and easily introduce that new technology in this haystack will define your ability to succeed. You cannot want your way into this. You can simply build, 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 get faster, fail quickly, tighten that loop as much as possible, and not pretend that you're going to be able to forecast this all. What we were able to find, though, is that we had very reliable outcomes when it came to the effectiveness of the system. But specifically, with regard to not needing to boil the ocean, is this concept that you can design technology that is good at surgically getting the fast paths through the data. You don't need to solve for, like, if you have hundreds of trillions of data points, you don't need to solve for all that up front. You need to f find a way to store it, and then you need to find a way to get fast paths in to ask the really basic questions, pre-compute the answers to the most common questions, and never scan. Don't scan. You know, what you're going to see right now is effectively a system that trades transactional costs for I.O. cost, because I.O. is something we can get really good at. And um, from the very beginning, we were most enthusiastic about S3 as a technology, which is like, from Amazon's perspective, they, they're like, oh, we have such cool stuff. Why are you focusing on S3? I.O. and the fundamentals, at the end of the day, are going to define your ability to succeed here. And if you get really good at getting away from transactional costs, like per transaction costs, and you get good to, at I.O. costs, you change the model on which you're able to deliver really large systems, which means you can have massive amounts of data. It's a lot more affordable. Specifically, we're going to cite this. Our cost of delivering the system started out with using uh, Cassandra and Solar, uh, which was DataStax Enterprise for us, fantastic set of technology, great partner, running on like EC2 instances. Think of like what you do when you have hundreds of terabytes of indexes, right? That kind of a system, if you work with this, works really well when it fits in the memory, but who wants to buy a several hundred terabytes of RAM, right? You're not going to do that. That doesn't make any sense. So what you do is you throw it on the SSDs and you get really good at scanning, right? It's a previous way of doing things. What we were able to do is get that moved to an S3 to say, let's take that compute cost and let's make it a storage and I.O. cost. By doing so, we were able to actually lower our AWS cost inside of AWS, which is already pretty approachable, by 95%. That is 1 20th of its previous costs. Building all that infrastructure and owning the back end that provides that I.O. on your own is crazy. Building your own infrastructure puts all this strategy at fundamental risk. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Josh Hallander. He's a director of engineering. He's going to talk to you a little bit about the technology we built. I want you to walk away with this one understanding. Um, high performance, probabilistic data lakes are the future of analytics. For us, security analytics. What you're going to see today is an exploration of using basic open source technology correctly aligned in front of S3, took a problem that was really, really difficult and made it embarrassingly parallel and easy to execute. So. Let's get into this. Josh. Thanks, Gene. 
Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, I'll just really briefly tell you a little bit more about what uh, Explorer is, what the challenge is that we're trying to solve. Um, uh, it is a way to interactively search our customers' entire network timeline. So as Gene said, we're capturing massive amounts of packet data. We're extracting metadata from those uh, and storing it and allowing the customer to essentially query anything that they can think of. Uh, so here's an example query uh, with the, which they could use for exploration. Um, another possible use case is to hunt for threats. Uh, so they may have been made aware of a threat that might have uh, uh, come into their network, and they can use Explorer to look for instances of that threat that have not already been detected. Uh, and then finally, the, the last thing is to be able to visualize these threats. Uh, just hunting for them, getting raw data, isn't, isn't very helpful to a security analyst who isn't necessarily uh, highly technical. This gives them the ability to work with the data um, through the tool. Uh, and the tool looks a little something like this. Um, it has query, uh, data listing, and then the graph, which is really where the meat of it is, where they can explore the graph of the data that they've uh, queried. So before Explorer, uh, we were storing data in Apache Cassandra, and we were storing it for key value lookups for when threat detections would come in. We would use Cassandra to, do, to quickly grab more metadata about the uh, detection that uh, an analyst might be working with. Um, in order to deliver a solution like Explorer, we needed to make that data searchable instead of just key value lookups. We needed to, make, we needed to add sorting so that they could say, I want to order my data by, say, the biggest connection or the, uh, the most bytes downloaded or the largest file in the connection or, conversely, the smallest. Um, and then also we wanted to include, uh, if you're familiar with uh, search uh, technology like Lucene or Solar, uh, facetings so that... Uh, users could do aggregations on demand and, and, and explore their data in a more uh, drill-down format. Um, so we chose, uh, being big Cassandra users and having uh, a decent amount of solar experience, we chose uh, DataStax Enterprise Edition, uh, which allowed us to uh, work on uh, the existing data in Cassandra, make it searchable with a fairly low effort. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to stick with Cassandra at the time was that our data is not immutable. Uh, it, a network connection begins and has a certain time, a lifetime, and data is accumulated, uh, findings are made during that lifetime, and then a connection ends. And at that point, um, you know, we, we, then it becomes immutable. It becomes essentially cold and dead. But we didn't want to wait till that data happens to make it searchable for the user, because sometimes connections can last minutes, or excuse me, seconds, sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes months. So uh, we have a large variability there. Uh, but most importantly, as Gina said, we want to uh, optimize time to market, and DataStax let us do that by essentially adding indexes to the data that we'd already accumulated. Um, this, this solution worked great in terms of getting us to market fast, and it was a, it's, it's a, it's a robust product. Um, however, there was a lot of operational uh, issues. Uh, it is a JVM-based product, so we had to deal with garbage collection uh, tuning right off the bat. Um, also, if any of you are familiar with solar, it's uh, tuning and working with its indices and caches is, is kind of a black art. Um, and so that expended, it took a lot of operational overhead. And data retention. Um, we have to provision EC2 instances and run large drives to accumulate this large volume of data, and retention became a big problem. Uh, the other side of the, the equation is its cost. It, you know, we have to pay licenses. Um, like we said, we have to have large amount of instances of storage. Uh, so the, the cost became exorbitant quickly, and then the operational overhead adds a cost in engineering time. So we, we started to look around for alternatives. Um, the possibilities are, well, we could mimic data stacks by building something with Cassandra and Elasticsearch, but the complexity of that was deemed to be even greater than using DSE, which I think, uh, knowing, knowing what I know about Elasticsearch and Cassandra separately, that I would not want to work with the two uh, together. Um, we looked at NoSQL solutions. Of course, NoSQL kind of means no index in our industry, so not really helpful when you are doing searching. Uh, we started looking at data lake solutions. You know, they're cost effective and they can do these SQL queries. So we looked at things like Hive, Presto. Uh, this was before Athena, but we would have con considered Athena at the time as well. Uh, what we really want was the cost and scale of S3-based warehouse or data lake, um, but with the query performance that we got out of DSE. Um, so we decided, you know, using the building blocks that, that AWS gives you, that we could build something that was a hybrid of custom plus off the shelf. 
And we arrived at a solution that uses kind of, I would say, the, the holy triangle of, of the three. Um, it looks a lot like Presto and Hive, um, but it leverages Spark, S3, and data stacks. And the way it does this is we stream our network data off of um, Kafka using Spark, and we write it to Cassandra to uh, handle the, um, the mutable nature of, of some of this data. As that data cools or becomes cold, uh, we will then trans, uh, use Spark to again transfer it to S3 for what we call cold storage. Um, this lets us leverage existing tools to handle the, the mutability problem and get our data into S3 where we can uh, really leverage the, the cost effectiveness and the performance. What we did, though, was we combined them with a secret ingredient, which was about trying to improve on the query performance problem. And that secret ingredient is probabilistic meta-indexes, which sounds like a fancy term that I made up, because I did. Um, they're really just bloom filters. <laughs> um, so Hive uh, has this feature already, bloom filters. Um, people aren't super familiar with it. I wasn't even familiar with it when I first started learning about Hive. But Orc has support for bloom filters on a block level. Well, block level is really targeted at HDFS. When you fetch file from HDFS, you can split it into certain uh, you can split a splittable format like Orc or Parquet into blocks. Orc has bloom filters that says that are designed to store data about the particular blocks that you're reading. And this lets, this lets a Hadoop uh, uh, query engine like Hive skip certain blocks that it doesn't need to read. Well, that doesn't really work for S3 where you're doing gets on large files. Um, so what we realized is our customization was, well, why don't we just push the, the bloom filters further up in the system and say, and, and allow our system to convict or tell us which files are interesting for a query before we even go fetch them. So we came up with the idea of what we call a searchable bloom filter or an index bloom filter. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, search technologies like Solar and, and Lucene uh, and Elasticsearch. So if you're familiar with them, this might look kind of, um, this might be familiar to you. Basically, what we, what we realized is we could take a bloom filter and treat it like terms in a document. Um, an inverted index, you store terms or words for searching, and then the documents that those terms uh, correspond to. And what we realized, we could, we could treat the bits in a bloom filter that were set as uh, indexes into an array as terms that say what documents correspond to them. So we have an index that looks something like this, where you could take an IP address and say, these are the values, the bits that need to be indexed in the filter that will go to a particular doc ID. And this lets us ask of our query system what files may have contained this IP address. So um, in order to build a system like this, we didn't want to have to build everything from scratch, right? We want to avoid inventing or reinventing wheels that had already been invented. Uh, Spark has a really great, rich set of APIs that allow you to interact with uh, the Spark SQL uh, data frame and data set um, API. Uh, so what we decided to do is we would use Spark's pruned filtered scan API to let Spark handle the query uh, parsing, the query optimization, then hand off the, uh, the optimized query to us uh, via, an, via its push down filters API, which says here's the filters that I would like to push down to your storage layer that you, you can run. So this is a, a, an API that's usually used for implementing uh, additional uh, storage um, solutions for Spark, so it's their, it's their plug-in API for storage solutions. Uh, so we, we use that to intercept those queries, go talk to our meta store and say, hey, what files in S3 might match this and what files wouldn't so that we could eliminate them. Um, then we hand off the resulting files back to what Spark calls its file scan RDD, which is what does the meat of the work. It does the fetching from S3, the filtering, the sorting, um, and any other particular uh, pieces that are involved in that query, UDFs and things like that. Um, this way we could, basically in this sandwich between step and one and three, we could get a lot of, a lot of uh, free tech, basically, and, and allow us to insert our little, little bit of secret sauce without doing a huge amount of work. Uh, the result, as I said, is a kind of hive-like query system, but with those problematic meta indexes. The outcome is that we got a 95% cost reduction over the previous system, but without sacrificing any real amount of performance. Um, 
what, the reason we were able to do this is because we minimize the amount of data that these queries need to pull from S3. We're no longer scanning for common queries. We're not scanning the entire file system, well, object store. Um, and this led to a P95 query time that was in seconds, which is competitive with, with what Datastax had, and a key value lookup time that was sub-second. That's right, we do key value lookups against a data lake. It, it seems nuts, but when you have a huge amount of data that you're ingesting and writing, and a, and a very tiny fraction that the customer is actually going to have time to look at, there's no way they could ever look at all of our data, we didn't want to expend a huge amount of effort keeping a key value store like Cassandra around for this data that, uh, that has a high cost. So we figured we could deliver that same performance with a data lake at a much lower cost. Uh, the, the other great thing, is, as John's talked about, is separating compute and storage means that our storage scale out is now zero, nearly zero effort. It pretty much is zero effort, right? S3 handles it for you. Um, and then on top of that, our query layer can be easily expanded to handle customer query volume without having to also expand storage or vice versa. Um, so how do AWS services specifically enable Explorer? Um, I talked about it a little bit. It's basically S3. It's all about S3. It's what makes Explorer work. Um, almost don't even need to say more. It's cheap, it's reliable, it's scalable, it's fast. Um, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, another technology we use is EMR. Um, when we first decided to build this system, we mentioned that we wanted to use Spark to DevOps, and DevOps said, well, we don't know how to operate Spark, so this is not, not a good idea. Um, we, we just leave that up to, S, to, to uh, AWS. Uh, EMR does a huge portion of that work for us. It gives us essentially kind of Spark on demand. Uh, it enables easy auto scaling of both our ingest and query clusters, and it makes it simple for us. Um, the future, so we talked about AWS roadmap being foundational to our business. Um, one feature that John talked about is that really coincides with what we're doing is S3 Select. Um, Combining our probabilistic metastore with, our, with S3 and then using S3 Select to further eliminate rows that we don't need back from S3 uh, is gonna give us huge performance increase and cost decrease. And we're currently working on integrating that into our system now that S3 has uh, Parquet support, or S3 Select has Parquet support, rather. Uh, leveraging uh, Kinesis Firehose, um, this is a, a product we've really taken an interest in lately to simplify our ingest pipeline. Uh, get the raw data into S3 right away, and then we can work on ingest down from that. Um, simplifying uh, the complexity of running a Kafka and Spark pipeline is something that we're really excited about. Um, and then going more serverless. So once you get your data in S3, you can rely on Lambdas to do a lot more work. Um, also, we were thinking about relying on uh, moving our Metastore off of DSE uh, and onto RDS. Uh, as well as trying to reduce query compute and ingest uh, server maintenance. So EMR is, is Spark on demand or Presto on demand or Hadoop on demand, but it is not serverless. You still have servers that you need to keep an eye on and, and, and manage. So lessons learned. Um, we took a features first approach and it worked really well for us. We got to market really quickly and it enabled us time while customers enjoyed the feature to work on making the feature cheaper and more efficient. Um, a hybrid of build and buy uh, is effective. You don't always need the solution delivered to you. Sometimes you just need the building blocks like S3, like EMR. Um, excuse me, open source ecosystem is rich. How do I go back? Um, the open source ecosystem is rich. You know, Spark has all the features we needed. We just needed to add our little bit of special sauce to it. Um, AWS tools are flexible building blocks. So S3, EMR, Firehose, Kinesis. Uh, they really give you all the, the basics that you need to, to build these systems, um, and that the AWS roadmap leads on innovation. We're very excited about the roadmap uh, for things like S3 Select that we're going to be using very soon. Um, in the end, a high-speed probabilistic data lake is fundamental for our business, and I think it's that this kind of thing is the future for everyone. So thank you. Okay, uh, great, and uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, you know, we'll uh, open it up for her, uh, questions if you have any. Anybody? I think we've got some mics set up, or you can yeah, uh, the mics? come up uh, to the stage, uh, whatever suits your fancy. Hey, in, a, in a data streaming, whoa, <laughs> in a data streaming scenario, 
Um, if we wanted to use S3 as a store, obviously, if you're doing tons and tons of puts, it's probably an anti-pattern, right? Um, so I've, I've been using DynamoDB and S3. So DynamoDB for the fast stuff, it's just you know constant puts and S3 for more batched. Um, is, there a, is there a better way to do that so I can just use S3? Is that like a fire hose scenario or somewhere we, we can buffer up and then you know shoot some optimal file size into S3? And, and I guess also second question, like what what would be the optimal file size for S3, like in your scenarios? Ooh, okay. Do you want to take the uh, first sure? Part I mean, I think I would say what you would say. Like Firehose uh, definitely. Uh, it, it's actually what we you know, like I said, we were looking at using it to to be a replacement for for Kafka, um, a Kafka Spark solution. Uh, Firehose definitely helps you just fire your your data at at um, S3, and it takes care of the aggregation. Uh, it has the ability to convert it to Parquet, which is something we're really you know keen on using. Uh, and then as far as optimal file size, that is an interesting one. Um, I, I think for Parquet, the HDFS uh, kind of era recommendation was a gigabyte per file. Uh, that's way too big for uh, S3 uh, for our use case, right? We, we would much rather have kind of the 128 to 256 meg files, I would say. It's not super scientific, but we, we know that the the uh, fetching of those, the, the latency of, of gigabyte files uh, introduces too much latency to our query. So we, we, we tend to go on the, the medium to smaller side. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would concur with that. I mean, we do see people with S3 Select, you know, maybe tend towards uh, going to a bit bigger file size mm -hmm. um, just because they can then, you know, start to use, if they've integrated Select, um, you know, start to pull specific subsets out of those files. But in general, if you're not using select, I'd say that you know traditional 128 to 256 megs is probably about the sweet spot of cost, performance, uh, uh, trade-off. Yeah, you know, I would like to comment on that, too. Um, the reality is you'll have to experiment. Obviously, you already know this. Um, and, and test for your specific use case. But one of the things that we are most delighted about S3 in particular, it's like the most counterintuitive system from a performance perspective you would get, you encounter. It actually gets faster the harder you push it. And we were able to, by throwing more resources at it, it actually spins up resources in the background and it, it gets ahead. So as, more, as we get crushed by demand, queries get shorter. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, no, the key to performance from S3 is definitely more and more parallel threads of uh, activity. Yeah. So, uh, you know, starting to uh, figure out how to partition your data accordingly so that you can really parallelize um, access is uh, really um, the way you optimize performance. Yeah. I was wondering what you guys were using for the front end interface. Uh, so, uh, what's the tech we're using for the front end interface? Yeah. That's just uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Just all homegrown kind of thing? Um, a little That's bit. We yeah. modify some, um, you know, if you're familiar with D3. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we modified that a little bit, make it a little faster. It's, it's pretty good, so, right? And then it's React on the back end. Yeah, typically. so you have a, you build something that takes the yeah. interface choices and turns it into a query. It yeah. consumes API, on, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, actually the, we have our own custom query language that, that we, uh, kind of dub PQL, which actually looks a lot like Lucene, um, because it, it turns it into Lucene queries, because mm -hmm. we used to run it against Solar, and then we take the Lucene queries and actually translate them into Spark SQL queries <laughs> uh, as a way to kind of migrate the system. Yeah. Um, you know, Lucene being a little more friendly to uh, URLs, basically. Yeah. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. oh. Hello. Uh, I have a question. So earlier you said uh, it's good to pre-process data for the data lake. So, uh, so actually something we had a problem with is we purposely avoided doing pre-processing because we did not want to limit our users' view of the data. Uh, so, is there any recommended sort of rule of thumb about would it be too much processing, pre-processing? Okay. Um, yeah, and obviously, you know, one size doesn't fit all in terms of recommendations. I mean, that's a general best practice is kind of separate ingest from the actual data lake itself and you know maybe start to do some transformation from raw into more optimized for ingest but you know certainly if you want to do uh, you know kind of give a fully materialized view in the data lake itself that's a viable option 
So, uh, you know, it really comes down to what you're trying to do. But um, we really want to try to get some segregation between, you know, for data quality purposes, for catalog purposes, for, you know, maybe trying to optimize things, um, uh, you know, start to segregate out um, different steps of workflow. But, you know, it's certainly uh, your call of what works best for you. Uh, just really quickly, um, you guys talked about uh, Bloom filters and basically pre-selecting data before before you did a push down to S3. Uh, I was wondering what's your um, S3 metadata uh, philosophy in terms of knowing exactly which S3 buckets to go after once you have once you have selected your data sets. Um, is it off the naming conventions, or you have implemented something? Uh, more unique uh, to define the metadata for S3 itself? Uh, to find to find the metadata, so, uh, sorry, it's a little echoey in here. The, um, the, the, uh, the index itself is telling us which files to pick off, right? So the, the metadata index is, you know, we, we create, say, like, tell me about this IP address, and it's literally giving us a list of the files in S3, and those files are Parquet, and they are the metadata that we've extracted from the, from the network transactions. Is that that makes sense. Yeah. Sort of getting on the right direction. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, if you if you're familiar with Hive or, or Presto, their their metadata catalog or, or glue, uh, just is is based on partitions, right? So it's how you partition your data in S3 with uh, with the basically the directory structure. Uh, we we've, we've taken that beyond that. We actually uh, instead of storing the partition information, we store each individual file so that we can associate the Bloom filters with each file. Okay. Um, if that helps. Very good. Sense. Thank you. Yeah. I have a quick question around uh, uh, glue. So especially when you're using the glue as a data processing mechanism, I noticed that like it has limitations in terms of uh, uh, change data capture, especially when there is a change data, instead of reprocessing the data, if you want to really inject only the change data. So is there any like, better mechanism, like uh, anything in the roadmap for uh, glue or uh, uh, any alternatives that you recommend? Um, well, obviously, I can't uh, comment about uh, Glue Roadmap, uh, particularly since I represent more of the storage services. But um, you know, we, we'd certainly be happy, um, you know, to uh, facilitate um, a Glue Roadmap discussion. But in general, if Glue, um, you know, particularly for the transformation side, um, doesn't meet your purposes, um, then you know, it's really at the end of the day built on uh, managed Spark, and so, you know, you may want to consider, um, you know, essentially using uh, Spark for your uh, transformation uh, engine today. But really want to encourage using Glue as the catalog if you can, at a minimum, because not only is it about cataloging your data, starting to associate richer metadata with the catalog, but it really becomes, if you think about it and think about data lake security, the catalog is the crux of granular security for your data lake. And Glue has introduced some really interesting new features that start to make fine-grained access and presenting different materialized views of what's in that data lake for different users, um, um, you know, kind of a reality for the data lake. So I definitely encourage catalog and if uh, ETL doesn't meet your purposes, you know, use um, something out of band to do uh, transformation. Super, makes sense. Okay, yeah. thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, for your, when you moved to the AWS ecosystem, what was your tool for um, ETL scheduling and tasks? Did you? If you're using Glue ETL, did you explore alternatives like Airflow, and can you yeah, know about uh, that journey? We, we actually do use Airflow uh, for our other. We we actually have like four data where, data lakes, <laughs> um, to, basically purpose built for different things. Uh, and for this one, actually, since it's kind of more of a uh, stream based, even even the the immutable or the mutable part uh, is sort of stream-based in a sense. We stream the data into Cassandra, and then we have a special kind of sidecar next that we write that allows us to kind of stream it back out as it, as it goes cold. So the ETL is more of a continuous process, and it's actually uh, Spark on EMR uh, that just runs in a loop, <laughs> um, which is really all Spark streaming is actually. It's just 
loops of, spat, of batch jobs that are just running smaller intervals. So uh, we, we generally use Spark, Spark streaming, as it were. So you don't really require a schedule because it's always running? Yes. Yes, that's, that's exactly okay. correct. Now, for our other warehouse stuff, we, we do use Glue, and uh, we also use Airflow for, for certain things. Did you yeah. find any advantages with Glue? Um, I mean, when we first started using Glue, it was a little newer, so, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm not actually really interacting with it so much, I can't say too much, but uh, Airflow uh, w was our first kind of choice because it, it was early on in Glue, and, and you know, it's, it's great because it's Python, and some of our developer, our data science developers are Python people, so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't use it much myself daily, so I can't comment too much. Sorry. It's okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, what was your strategy for updating mutable records in the S3 data lake? Hmm. Aha. So we don't. <laughs> um, because it's, you know, like, and actually, I, I talked a little about some of the things that Hive does. Hive actually does have updates, which I think is just is crazy uh, if you're using the org format. Uh, what we do instead is, uh, like, like I kind of pointed out, we, we never really got rid of DSC entirely. We actually use DSC for the hot data. And then, um, no. Oh. <laughs> I lost my mic there. Uh, as the data gets cold, it actually becomes completely frozen at some point when the network connection ends. That's when we move it into S3. We do occasionally, because we are a company that looks back over our data, we find new findings about data from a security standpoint. Um, we do occasionally make new hot records that actually overlap the existing records. And the query system is designed in such a way that it will query both systems and then merge the results together. Um, which is actually what a solar, like a solar cluster does. It queries all the systems, merges the results together. We just have to merge things from kind of two disparate systems. So we cheated. So for very large systems, you want to take a, a process at least once approach, which means you're willing to take the outliers of over-processing yeah. more data than you need to, and you just get good at deduping it after, this, after the fact. So yeah. that gives you uh, robustness against late arriving data as well as out-of-order data. Yeah. Okay. The amount and of updates are much smaller. Then. Okay, I think we're being okay. cut off. Yeah, I think we're being cut off. Your mic uh, Nobody asked was for a after signal. Us, right? But um, if you have <laughs> questions, uh, come up here, and uh, we'll be yeah. happy to uh, yeah. take your questions uh, you know, off to the side here. So thank you again for uh, attending.